On ASEAN Highlight this week, we take a look at the informal ASEAN Foreign Ministers meeting which was held here in Bangkok earlier this Monday. At this event, we also caught up with Dr. Martina Talagawa, the Indonesian Foreign Ministers, for an exclusive interview. More in this report. On Monday, an informal meeting between the 10 ASEAN Foreign Ministers and their representatives took place in Bangkok as they discussed various strategic issues regarding the future of the East Asia Summit or EAS. Russia and the United States are poised to join a key annual meeting later this year between the leaders of ASEAN and their dialogue partners, which includes Australia, China, India, Japan, New Zealand and South Korea, making the number of participating countries grow to 18. ASEAN Secretary General Dr. Surin Pitsuwan told our reporter about the need for ASEAN countries to be prepared in their coordination efforts in order to maintain the region's centrality within the expanding EAS. Be very, very careful because ASEAN 10 uh, could lose the control and the centrality because each of the major members, particularly the new members, the US and Russia, will come in with their own sets of issues, their own agenda. Uh, we don't want to be it purely strategic and political issues. We don't want it to be issues of their interests, but we want to be the issues that will benefit us. In other words, the issues that uh, uh, will somehow consolidate ASEAN, will integrate ASEAN and will connect ASEAN with each other. What began as an idea advanced by Malaysia of having an economic forum exclusively for Asia led by Asian countries, the EAS has evolved to become a venue for ASEAN and its dialogue partners to discuss issues that concern their interests in areas such as finance, economic planning, energy, education, natural disasters management, pandemic and infrastructure development. Since the first EAS in Kuala Lumpur in 2005, the forum has also become a venue for power play in Asia to the benefit of ASEAN, something that the association wishes to maintain even with the inclusion of more global powers to the forum. It will be chaired by ASEAN. The interesting part is the US president will come, the, the Russian president will come, the Indian prime minister will come, the Chinese prime minister will come, but all of them sit under the chairmanship of an ASEAN member state. This year happens to be Indonesia. So we have to be careful that the chairmanship of ASEAN can conduct and can uh, regulate the process to our benefit, rather than losing the control of it. As Dr. Surin stresses on the important roles that the ASEAN chair will play ahead of the 6th East Asia Summit due to be held in Indonesia later this year, our news team had the privilege to interview the current chair of ASEAN, Dr. Martina Talagawa. The Indonesian foreign ministers told us about the three main priorities that ASEAN should aim to achieve this year. We have shared with our ASEAN colleagues three priorities for this year, uh, building on the uh, achievements of previous years, because you must remember uh, the chairmanships of ASEAN uh, takes place for one year, uh, but uh, each new chairman must build, we believe, on previous gains so that we don't reinvent the wheel each time a new chairman uh, takes over. Uh, so we have three main priorities building on the past uh, gains. The first one is to ensure significant progress in ASEAN community building. We be, we be sure that throughout 2011 we make significant progress so that we will be on script uh, by 2015 to achieve this ASEAN community. Mm. Uh, the second aim is to ensure that we continue to maintain a peaceful and, and stable regional environment uh, that has been uh, precious that, uh, in allowing ASEAN to pursue economic development. Uh, here, of course, the East Asia Summit becomes very important because this year we, are, we admit uh, Russia and United States for the first time. So we want to be sure that the East Asia Summit becomes part of the instrument to create uh, peace and stability for our region. And the third priority along the line of our, the theme of our uh, chairmanship, ASEAN community in a global community of nations, uh, basically projecting or, or initiating the process of uh, thinking 
and acting as one uh, ASEAN at the global level. Uh, so not only are we a community in our region, but we are also a community that acts in cohesion or with cohesion at the global level on, on dealing with several global issues. Furthermore, Dr. Martin Natalagawa also shared with us a glimpse of his vision on the type of foreign policy that ASEAN should pursue on the world stage. Well, I mean, you know, you, you always uh, reiterate the idea of um, the so-called dynamic equilibrium yes, among yes. states, you yes. know. Maintaining this dynamic equilibrium, isn't that just uh, a resurrection of the spirit of Bandung, 1955? Uh, in a way, almost. Uh, in a way, because, not quite, because Bandung principles uh, was more on the uh, non-aligned, uh, in the sense that uh, we have then, of course, a world that was divided between East and West, and then, and then, and, and then how countries like Indonesia navigate uh, that reality uh, by choosing not to ally oneself to one of the other camps. Uh, but now the world of today is far more complex. You do not have an East and a West to navigate through, uh, rather you have a complex, uh, uh, di you know, multi-dimensional, simultaneous, interrelated issues that we must try to contend with. Mm -hmm. And when we speak of uh, dynamic equilibrium, among other things, it is uh, an expression of uh, rejection of balance of power, mm -hmm. containment policies as if the rise of one must be contained, must be seen as being a challenge, but rather I think there is space for common security, common prosperity, common stability, and, and, and for a more win-win, mutually reinforcing, mutually, mutual interest rather than a zero-sum relationship. Mm, so a world connected through soft power, perhaps? Absolutely. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Soft power is, is uh, uh, one dimension uh, that I think has been somewhat often uh, unappreciated in international relations because uh, soft power, uh, soft diplomacy, persuasion, the power of persuasion can, can be very instructive, can be very, very, very powerful as well. I use the term uh, waging peace, you know, in the same way that one wages war normally, we can wage peace aggressively, uh, going for to create momentum towards uh, conflict resolution and those who are against it can be seen to be uh, really put on the spot. Yeah. You think ASEAN have a uh, a mandate to exercise its soft power more in, in the world, perhaps, in international affairs? I, I think uh, if there is uh, an element, uh, a quality that ASEAN possesses, it would be, among others, in the soft uh, power, uh, because we have, of course, robust, strong economy, but at the same time, it is uh, the quality of, our, uh, of what we all are about uh, in terms of a uh, group of countries that we can really project that soft power potential. Okay. Despite his talk on ASEAN soft power on the world stage, the Indonesian foreign minister also recognized the challenges ahead and emphasizes on ASEAN community building in its various facets, stressing the needs to make the association more people-centered. Community as capital C, ASEAN community with capital C, uh, may be legislated. You can, you can have declarations that says, come 2015, we will have this ASEAN community with capital C uh, by sheer legislative declarative act. But cap, uh, community with a small c as a sense, as a feeling, as a we feeling, as a sense of togetherness, you cannot uh, create that overnight. It cannot be imposed top uh, down. It must be a grassroots, it must be people-driven. And here, I think, is the challenge for ASEAN uh, leaders, ASEAN le uh, officials and ministers, how we can make ASEAN a bit, little bit more down-to-earth and a, bit, a little bit more real in terms of its contribution and impact to the old so-called ordinary ASEAN citizens. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we must, as we look at 2015, we must look at oh, those areas where, where uh, uh, corporations are really meaningful in terms of ordinary people's uh, daily activities. 
You can watch the full interview with Dr. Marty Natalikawa right here on RCN TV at 8.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. You can also watch it on our Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash rcn.tv. Next up, we have an update on the situation in the Spratly Islands on the South China Sea between the Philippines and China. On Thursday, the Philippines have lodged a formal protest at the United Nations over China's claims to the Spratly Islands and the adjacent waters in the South China Sea, highlighting its disagreement with a formal note and map sent by China to the UN Secretary General in 2009, outlining the basis of Beijing's claim to the disputed islands. The Philippines government argues that Beijing's claim had no legal basis under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and said parts of the Spratly Island were also part of the Philippines based on international laws. Last month, Manila also complained that Chinese patrol boats inappropriately harassed a Philippine oil exploration vessel in the disputed waters near the Spratly. Meanwhile, China Foreign Ministry spokesman Hong Lei insisted that the Spratly Islands are Chinese territory. Malaysia and Vietnam had earlier fired similar protests against Beijing's claim. Earlier this month, Manila protested to the UN over China's claim to the Kalayan Island in a Spratly believed to be rich in deposits of oil, gas and minerals. The Philippines vows to pursue oil exploration in the South China Sea and to upgrade a military airfield in Titu Island, the largest of the seven Spratly Islands Manila currently occupied. Consisted of hundreds of small reefs and islands and surrounded by rich fishing grounds and potentially by gas and oil deposits, the Spratly Islands are claimed in their entirety by China, Taiwan and Vietnam, while portions are claimed by Malaysia and the Philippines. And at the same time, Brunei Darussalam has established a fishing zone that overlaps a southern reef. The area has been under multilateral dispute for decades. We wrap things up this week with the New Year celebration of various people across Southeast Asia, the so-called Water Festival. Many people in Southeast Asia celebrate the New Year this week, particularly those with the shared Brahmin and Indic traditions in mainland Southeast Asia, in Laos, Myanmar, Thailand and Cambodia. The New Year was also celebrated by the Indian ethnic communities, particularly the Sikh and the Tamil communities living across the archipelago of Southeast Asia in Malaysia, Singapore and Indonesia. Elsewhere, similar celebrations are also marked in eastern India, Sri Lanka and by the Thai ethnic minorities in southern China. According to various localization of the Indic reckonings that emerged in the high culture of mainland Southeast Asia almost a thousand years ago, the modern-day celebrations are marked by various Buddhist and Hindu rituals to herald in the new year, making merits as well as paying respect to their family and elders. Also known as the Water Festival, the New Year celebration which falls on the hottest period of summer in Southeast Asia also sees water fights as people of all ages commemorate the occasion by splashing water at each other. The New Year festivities here are known as Tinyan Festival in Myanmar, as Bun Pi Mai Festival in Laos, as Jo Chanan Thamai in Cambodia and as Songkran in Thailand, deriving from the Sanskrit word Maha Sangkran. The nature of the festivities and celebrations varied according to local customs. On Wednesday, the water fight that took place in the city of Bangkok broke the world record for the biggest continuous water pistol fight, where a crowd of 3,477 people participated in the water fight in the business district of the Thai capital, which lasted for 10 minutes. And that's it for this edition of ASEAN Highlight. And on behalf of the RCN News team here at Thai News Agency, I wish you all a lovely new year and สวัสดีครับ.